Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Congregational Church. We are so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you for coming in on this little bit of a brisk morning. And also thank you if you're joining us on the website or on Facebook. Uh, service is posted. Uh, our tech team is awesome. They're pretty on it. Get it on there even later in the day on Sunday, but by Monday. Uh, let your friends know that they are able to share in worship from home with us if they choose to do that. Thank you so much. Just a reminder, the collection plates are still in the Narthlex along with the sign-up for altar flowers and coffee hosting. Thank you all for signing up for the flowers and the hosting. Still some spaces on there, so if you're able to do that, we sure appreciate it. Thanks so much. This morning, we have the privilege of installing Pastor Luke as our new pastor. We heartily welcome Pastor Luke, his wife Crystal, and their daughter Nora to our church in the Fremont community. May God bless them and keep them as they begin their ministry here at First Congregational Church. Also welcome to Pastor Luke's family that's joining them today and to support this new chapter in his life. And we do invite you to join us down in Fellowship Hall for a little social time after the service today. We're hoping you can join us. The Executive Council deacons, <coughs> excuse me, and tech board are asking folks to sit up closer to the front. This is beautiful. Uh, I know I also asked for a little grace on that for those of us who have been sitting in the play, same place for decades. We're, we're going to adjust as we can. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and thank you once again, Susan, for doing script for us. Uh, it's a great program, and, and I'm going to try to catch you today after church as well. <laughs> and uh, just a reminder that awesome Lorraine, thank you. She got those directories done for us today. It's not in your bulletin because she wasn't sure she would get them done, but she did. So the new 2022 directories for our church are back in the narthex be sure and take one of those a uh, reminder that deacons will be meeting this thursday seven o'clock in the library or by zoom uh, i'll probably be here in the library most of you know i'm not much of a techie person but i think i can learn so we'll get to that part but that is this thursday at seven for the deacons yeah i think that is about it except for i do want to share with you just because Last week when I noticed the cello in the picture with Pastor Luke and Crystal and Nora, and it was such a beautiful family picture, I found out that was taken at a wedding. Nobody plays the cello. <laughs> but we're still going to love them anyway. But I just wanted to let you know that because I made kind of a big deal about that last week. <laughs> but maybe Sue, Sue and I will get our cellos out and we'll, we'll try that sometime. But <laughs> I wish you many blessings for your day. Thanks again for being here. Oh, oh, and just a quick reminder, we are doing communion, so if you did not get your elements coming in, be sure and raise your hand so we can get one to you. Thanks so much. Oh, my word, where did everybody come from? I had my back turned to you the whole time. My word, what a good-looking group this morning. This is the day the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice, and we will be glad in it. Welcome to church. Um, uh, as we pass through our daily life, as the week went by, has God touched you in a certain way that you'd like to share with us this morning? Does anybody have something you can say, I have something that really happened pretty cool this week, and I want to, to share it with anybody. Please put your hand up, and we will hand you the hot mic, and then you can go ahead and share with us. So. Sorry about that. Um, my day or my week was filled with lots of really special little praises, but one in particular, I got this beautiful text from one of my sons. And those of you that know our four sons, one of them was a particularly wild child. And he has grown up and realized a lot of things in his life, but he sent me the most beautiful love honoring text I've ever gotten from any of them. And just I was just so thankful, and so God is just so definitely in, at work in his life, and so I praise God for that. Amen. 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 Anybody else? Oh. Amen. Yes. <laughs> praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. 
Amen. I saw another hand go up someplace. Pastor Luke. Well, I just wanted to share that I am so thankful that we were able to get the move uh, done and it went about as well as that can happen. Uh, no, nothing broke. We got in the house. We're, I don't know, somewhere between 50 and 75% unpacked. So that's great. There's still all sorts of fun things that we're like, where, where did that go? You know, we're still missing stuff. But it's, uh, so we're so thankful that we were able to do that, get into the house, and uh, we're not far from being able to put in our house in Ypsilanti on the market. So we're also thankful for that. Uh, keep that in our, your prayers that that sells quickly. So probably uh, next week will be when we have an open house. So if you know someone who wants a house in Ypsilanti, tell them. Or at least tell them to start putting bids on. If we can uh, bid that, uh, that price up, we'd be really thankful. Amen. Matt. I just want to uh, praise the Lord for Deb and uh, how she's doing. She's got seven more, right, seven more um, radiation treatments to go. And um, the uh, side effects have not been uh, too severe at all. We were really concerned about what, uh, what the side effects of, uh, you know, radiation to the brain would potentially be. Um, but they have been pretty good, and her radiologist is pretty encouraged and thinks that maybe you know, she'll get through, you know, the rest of them without anything. So anyways, I just praise God uh, for that and, um, and for her, uh, her attitude and her spirit. Um, she helps me every day um, with that. So I'm going to give the microphone up before I cry. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Well, if I'm looking at pastor's notes right here, it looks like a good message this morning. So... <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay. My name tag does not want to stick, so. Good to be in worship today as we celebrate God's love and his blessings. Let's read from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations we celebrate god's presence with us as we worship him today let us pray father you have already been speaking to our hearts this day as we've given praise as god we've opened our hearts our mind our soul and our spirit asking you to speak to us and god for us to listen to you we're so grateful that, God, you bring us together. We have been in prayer for this moment about installing Pastor Luke and Crystal. We thank you for that opportunity. But most of all, God, we thank you that you love us, you care about us, you died for us, and we can come together to celebrate you, God, as one who cares about us. Bless us in this service as we celebrate you, God, and we focus on you and we look to you, our provider, our hope for today and tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. First Congregational Church of Fremont, members and friends, we are assembled before God to worship him and to install Reverend Luke and Crystal Schmalz. Pastor Luke and Crystal responded to your call to become the lead pastor of First Congregational Church and whose installation has been duly authorized by you as members and friends of the First Congregational Church of Fremont. 
At this time, I'd like Pastor Luke and Crystal to come forward. And if Nora wants to come, that's okay too. As we do the installation, it's great to have Pastor Luke's mom and dad with us today. Penny and Levi. Levi and Penny, so. Oh, mom and brother. Sorry, Levi. It's good to have your brother here, Levi. She's going to take an offering already, so. <laughs> Pastor Luke and Crystal, as minister and supporting spouse, the duties of your holy office are clearly set forth in the Word of God. As an ambassador of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are first to preach the Word of God in a way that truly honors the scriptural teachings and the principles of, living, of the living God, 1 Peter 4:11. Under your pastoral care, the followers of God are to be directed to walk in the commandments of the Lord as devoted followers. Those not walking the way of God are to be warned with all the truth with which is found in the word of God. Adhering to the message of the prophet Ezekiel said, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. And Jesus said, Let the little children come to me. Mark ten fourteen. So it is that children and youth must be in special sense of the object of your pastoral instruction and care. Pray diligently for your people and to them to be a pattern of faith and good works. Administer the holy sacraments as a steward who desires to give the message of salvation and hope to followers of God and one who is a comforter of troubled souls. Pastor Luke and Crystal, do you as pastor and spouse earnestly purpose to fulfill these pastoral duties? If so, please respond by saying, yes, I so do purpose by the help of God. Yes. yes. I so do purpose by the help of God. And by the running daughter that runs around. It's okay. You know what? It is a joy to have children in the worship. So we're not, we don't feel bad about that. We celebrate that. So don't. And Nora brings such life. That's a good thing. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through, 4, 1 through 2, and verse 5, which is a scripture often shared at ordination services that provide a challenge that is given today at this time of ordination. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage. With great patience and careful instruction, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Pastor Luke and Crystal. Now to the congregation of First Congregational Church. Please stand. First Congregational Church of Fremont family, friends, you have received Reverend Luke and Crystal Schmalz to be your lead pastor couple. And I challenge you to accept the word of God as it is preached to you, whether it be for your comfort or for your admonition or your instruction. Even as Christ has said, consider carefully how you listen. Luke chapter 8, verse 18. Children and teens are to receive instruction to the house of the Lord in accordance with the counsel of the Apostle Paul to Christian parents to bring children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Pray for Pastor Luke, Crystal, and Nora, that the ministry offered in this place may tend to the salvation of many souls, and that through sacrificial labors, you, together with your pastor, may be enriched in your serving. Honor and esteem the one who is to minister to your souls. As the Apostle Paul exhorts, respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love. Because of their work, live in peace with each other. Do you now, as members and friends of this church, as devoted followers of Jesus Christ in his church, accept these obligations? If so, respond me by, with me by saying, yes, by the help of God. Yes, by the help of God. I'd like you to go and stand down here. Now, I'd like for the leaders of the church to come. Go ahead, Crystal. And I'd like them to come, and we're going to pray. For Pastor Luke and Crystal, and during, and during this time, we'd like to lay hands on them 
that we would be an encouragement and bless them. Our Father, we come right now at this particular time. It is a planned time of your time, God. These are things that you have been at work at, and God, that you oversee. And right now, as God, we pray for Pastor Luke and Crystal. As we place hands on them, we recognize, God, our desire to support them, to encourage them, to lift them up, and God, to recognize that they are called of you by you and for you in your service. We thank you for this most important time as Pastor Luke and Crystal and Nora are installed as pastoral family here at First Congregational Church of Fremont. For God, we're grateful for the lives that will be transformed, lives that will be challenged, changed, and God honored. So Father, for the days that are ahead, we pray that you'd give wisdom and guidance. And I pray, Father, that in those moments of discouragement, that there would be words of encouragement that would come along. I pray for those times of challenges, God, that there would be someone that will come and, God, just speak words of insight. And, God, together as a family, may you be honored, Jesus. For Pastor Luke and for Crystal and Nora, this is a day that begins that Father will... Bring many, many more days of worship and praise and people coming together to make a difference in Fremont and beyond. And we give you thanks, God, our God, in the name of God the Father and of the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Upon these mutual promises, Reverend Luke and Crystal Schmaltz, 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 I'll get it right, are installed, yeah, don't put a T in there either, you may be seated, are installed as lead pastor of First Congregational Church of Fremont, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We praise God. Now, may the Lord truly bless you, Pastor Luke, Crystal, and Nora, at First Congregational Church of Fremont, as the pastoral family so that you may bring forth much fruit and that your fruit may remain. Blessings. Well, now I suppose it's my turn to take over. Let us sing. Uh, I believe Waymaker. Yes, indeed. So if you can, please stand for the word. And God has certainly showed us that he is a waymaker in all circumstances um, by bringing Pastor Luke here and his family. Here we go. Can you hear me out here? There we go. Okay. Who you are, you are here. 
you to join me in prayer. This is our time of a, our prayer of confession. So I'm going to take a short moment of silence to allow you an opportunity to think back on your week. And if there is anything that you need to ask for forgiveness, to give to God, let's take a moment to do this and then we will pray our prayer of confession. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your love and Your mercy. We thank You for the grace You continually bestow on us. Lord, You see how we have sinned against You individually, corporately as a church, and as a society. You have seen the places where we have failed to live up. You see the places where we have done those things we should not do, or the things, or have not done those things we should have done. I pray for Your forgiveness. I pray that You cleanse us of that sin. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as your pastor now, I have the pleasure of telling you that God has forgiven your sins. By His death on the cross and His resurrection, you are now free and pardoned of those sins. Amen. And if I can find my spot again. And we respond with the Gloria Patre. Glory.
be seated. I have like 400 pieces of paper up here, so if you see me shuffling around, I, for some reason I have my grocery list and a syllabus from school, not seminary, college. I don't know why it's up here, but there's, I just have a lot of working parts for some reason. Today our scripture passage comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. And it goes like this. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth have been, has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember that I am with you always to the end of the age. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you open our hearts, that we may hear what you have for us, that I may speak with wisdom and deliver the word that you have given for your people today. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, today is a big day. Uh, hopefully it's a happy day for everyone. I, for one, am thrilled to death and just incredibly happy. And I I can't help uh, but believe that this has been God worked out. God has brought us together, and I really believe God has wonderful plans for First Congregational, and I'm just happy to play my small little part in that. Um, but as I was thinking about what, what to speak about today, where, where I wanted to go, I, I wish I could have said, oh, it's I'm coming here thrilled and happy and excited, and it's all going to be roses and daisies and other beautiful things, puppy dogs and you know little birds tweeting and all that. But I don't know about you, but I come today to the pulpit a little, little nervous. Now, part of that is just I'm starting a new job. As anybody who started something, there's always a little bit of like, oh, I hope this is the right thing, I hope we made the right choice, I hope they made the right choice, I hope I don't mess this up, what, what's going to happen? So there's that, but you know, also as a father, you know, there's that fear that all parents have for their children, well, it never goes away, uh, you know, I hope they're okay, I hope something good happens to them, I, you know, I hope they're safe, and then it grows from there, you know, there's, we live in a, well, we always li have lived in a crazy world, it's never not crazy, but there's some tension in the air. There's worry about war. There's, it actually looks like it might happen instead of just worrying. There's this whole pandemic thing. Everybody's angry at everybody. I mean, it just, it doesn't matter. It's, everybody's mad, and there's just, there's a sense of no one, tr no one really knows who they can believe or trust. Every institution seems to be falling down on the job, and there's just a lot of concern. At least I know I feel that way, and I imagine many of you also have that, from your, your own personal worries that, you know, as individual to each of you, to your worries about how things are going, how uh, society is going, how the world's going, is something going wrong? And then we're at a transition point as a church. Our churches just went through a momentous moment. A new pastor has been brought in, and while we're all hoping for the best, and I certainly believe the best will happen, we all know that in the back of our minds there is always that question of how is this going to go? Is this going to go well? What should we be doing as a church? What are those steps? Is, it, is this uh, Yahoo we've invited in going to do something crazy? Or maybe he's going to come up with some miraculous idea. Does he have the vision to guide this church into the next well, I won't be here for 150 years, but we have our 150th anniversary, year anniversary. Does he have what it takes to set us up so we have another 150 years if the Lord should tarry? What should we do as a church? What programs should we do? You know, should we get lights and smoke machines? Should we, should we uh, not use the organ? Should we use the organ more? I mean, there's all these questions that as a church we start asking. There's, from the individual to our institution as a church to society, there's all these questions. What should we do? Maybe, you know, I saw some church in, I don't know, somewhere across the country doing something cool. Maybe we should do that. What programs? What should we go for? What should we do? And in moments like this, where there's so much 
uncertainty. What does the future hold? What should we do? I find it's incredibly important to return back to the basics. Go back to what we are called to, what our mission as a church is. And that's what we find in our passage here. We find our call. You see, we like to add all these programs, we like to add all this stuff on, we like to get all crazy and put all these things in and do lots of things. We've got to be doing more stuff. And I'm not against doing stuff, programs, outreach and missions and needs. And There's so much good stuff, so many needs that we as our church can do, but it can feel so overwhelming that it is important for us to go back and ask, what is it that we're actually called to do? What is First Congregational's mission to Fremont? And we get that mission from Jesus Christ before he ascends. His last word to his disciples is like, okay, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to send you a helper, but this, this is what I want you to do. And it's very simple, or simple to describe, maybe not simple to do. It's a call to make disciples. There's lots of stuff we can do and lots of stuff that need to be done. But as a church, we have one job, and that job is to make disciples. First, we need to make ourselves disciples. Now, in this passage, I, I have to make sure I admit that I'm not necessarily exegeting it correctly when I'm saying this. Jesus is calling us, his disciples, to go out into the world and make disciples. But I th- don't think I'm stretching the text too far to say that. Part of that call is to make ourselves disciples. That discipleship process never ends for ourselves. It doesn't, you know, say, oh, I did it. I said my prayer. I got baptized. I've gone to church 14 times and I'm done. I can put my card on. I, I know up. I don't have to worry about it. No. This is a call to us to continue our process of becoming ever more disciples of Christ. And of course, it's this call to reach out into the community because what's the point if we're not drawing others to the love of Christ? There's lots of good organizations. We could be a bowling league, uh, the, uh, the Moose Club. We could just be the we're pretty cool, much cool people and we're going to get together and hang out. And I don't know, we could be the philosophy club. We could just talk about cool books. But that's not what a church, the church, is called to do. And so I'm here to remind us, remind myself probably even more than anything, that what we're called to do is make disciples. And Jesus even makes it real simple and tells us how we're supposed to do that. He tells us we do this by teaching and by baptizing. A disciple is first born, created through the act of baptism. They are brought into the body of Christ. They reenact Jesus' death and resurrection through the entering of the water and coming out. And then they are continued to be made holy, more Christ-like, through the teaching, through the following of the commands of Christ. Now, if you are wondering what is actually meant when we say a disciple, that's a good question, because it's one of those words that, it's one of those Christian words that we use all the time, but if you stop and think about it, no one ever defines what a disciple is. And I think my favorite definition of it or use of the term disciple comes from acts you see this used over and over again and in one particular acts 9 2 it goes like this and and asked him speaking of saul paul before he converted and asked him for letters to the synagogues at damascus so that if you follow any who belong to the way men or women he might bring them bound to jerusalem this is saul when he hated christians going to persecute them But note what he called these Christians. We actually know from the book of Acts that that name wasn't used yet. He called them the followers of the way. And I think that is a fantastic description and definition of what a disciple is. A disciple is one who follows the way of Jesus Christ. I particularly like it because the way is, by using it, it has so... It encompasses so much. It's a term that encompasses the entirety of life. It reminds us 
that there's so much more. Sometimes we can fall into ruts. Sometimes we think, oh, I got all the intellectual sides. I've affirmed all the matters of faith. So I'm good. I'm a Christian. God forbid that it ever actually, you know, change anything about how we live. Or maybe you're the reverse. This is a little bit of uh, the tradition I come from where, oh, you've got to worry about all these rules about how you live. You've got to, you know, some and some they even have like very direct, like here's your list. You've got to do this and you've got to do this. You've got to do this. I mean, but, you know, heaven forbid that you take any moment to think through any theology because we're so busy, you know, following the rules. We're all, you know, depending on what your background is, we're all guilty of some of these. But the way calls us to be so much more. I love it because it, it tells us, first of all, we got to know the way. Like, you got to know where you're going. So it, didn't call, it says we got to bring our mind into it. We actually got to read the Bible. We got to study. You can't follow the way if you don't know what the way is. You can't follow, you can't get somewhere until you know the route. It calls us to bring our emotions into it because the way isn't easy. If it was, everybody would do it. If it was easy, we'd do it. I mean, there's lots of easy things out there. This is not one of them. So you've got to love the one whose way it is. You've got to love Christ. Otherwise, walking the way isn't easy. And finally, it's action. We actually have to follow the way. The way is a, something we do as well, not just in our heads. I love the description of the life of a disciple founded, again, in Acts 2, 43 through 47. This is this wonderful description of what the Christian life should look with. Something that maybe we aspire to, or at least take inspiration from. All came upon everyone because, because of the many wonders and signs being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. Did I write the wrong one down? Ah, I did. This is why you double check before you, uh, you read a, your sermon notes. So, there we go. 42. I was close. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because of the many wonders and signs being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all who had any need. Day by day they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home. They ate their food with gladness and generous, generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So what is a disciple? A disciple is one who listens to the teaching. They fellowship. If you notice here, the, one of the big things is they got together. They spent time together. It's not simply, uh, you know, 45 minutes on Sunday and don't talk to me ever again. It's about coming together. It's about the breaking of bread, of partaking in communion, but also of the unity that is spoken of when you join together of a meal. It's about prayer and giving to the needy. It's about having a generous heart. It's about being known in the community as, you know, if you, if you need help, find one of those people. I know a person. They're loving. They're, they're so full of goodwill. It's a challenge that I, we often have to ask ourselves. Are, am I no, what am I known for? Am I known as the person who is generous, who is loving? Or am I known as the, well, maybe the unfriendly one, or heaven forbid, the jerk? Am I known for the one who, uh, you know, if they, if they see you in the distance, they duck away and walk the other direction, which is my my fault. I, that, I do that. I'll, I'll admit, I'm the one who, I try to be friendly, but some days that introvert inside of me is like, no, don't talk to people. You, oh, yes, I do need something from the deodorant aisle. And head down the aisle. This is a, what a disciple is. It's we're pulling these things together. 
And there's so many things we need to work with. Each and every one of us will have those areas in our life that God puts on us. Maybe you're, maybe you're generous to a fault, but maybe you don't have goodwill about it. Or maybe you are great at fellowship. You gather together, but you have anger inside. Or, or maybe you, you're guilty of uh, not being known as a Christian. Maybe you're known first for your love of your football team or who you vote for or your job or maybe you, you know, you got it. You're actually following, fulfilling many of these things, but many of the people who know you would be surprised. Uh, you live a very personal life that is pleasing to God, but then they're like, really? I didn't know that about you. This is the call that we as a church have. This is a call that we are called to live out. But it's also the call that we have to draw others to. Yes, we are called to personally grow, to develop, to become more and more the disciple of Christ, but we're also called to draw others to this. This is not a closed place. This is a place that is opened wide. Because we have something great. Now, I said earlier, the way is not easy, and it's not. It's constantly calling us to be better, to be more than we are. It doesn't leave us in the place it found us. It's constantly bringing ourselves before God to be worked on, to be convicted about whatever it is that we struggle with. But we know it's worth it because it brings us meaning. It brings us purpose. It involves us in a story that is so much more. We look around and I can't help but wonder if part of the anger, the hurt, the pain that we see in our society, in our world, in our community is not in part brought about because people have lost that story. You can hardly blame someone for choosing some cause and getting angry about it because well, what else is there in life? We're here and then we're gone. So you might as well do something. You know, you choose your cause. I don't know. It could be anything. It could be your sports team to saving the environment to electing some politician. Any of it. You could choose whatever you want. And people do. Because you've got to have something. You've got to have a reason to get up in the day. We see, maybe even you know, someone in your family who doesn't have that reason to get up. I hear you every now and again, you read these stories about uh, Japan where there's these often men who they don't have a reason. And so they literally stop leaving their room. They just close the door one day and 10, 15, 20 years later, they're still in there. Some family member brings them food, but they just don't leave because why? There's nothing out there. There's no point. So why do we fall away? Why do we encourage others to fall away? Because we believe there's a point. We can go to that person who's like, I don't got anything, and say, no, you do. Let me tell you a story. You have a point. It doesn't matter. You don't, it, your skill level, your, your competence, your merit, it doesn't matter. Because there's always something more that we can do. When we're sick, it can be a time for us to declare God's glory because we're still living. We still do, we're still having joy in our sickness. In our house, we're using the gifts we have to do good in the world because we believe that there's something more, that we are part of a story, that we are beloved children of God who wants good and right in the world. And this is what we are called to do. That is our mission. In all the uncertainty that we all can get wrapped in, whether that uncertainty is of a societal nature or of a personal nature, it's very normal. That fear is normal and in many ways healthy. You're supposed to be afraid of some things. If there is a bear hanging out in your backyard, do not go out there. Be afraid. Grizzlies are not your friend. We cannot hug them. Don't hug a grizzly. It's just one of my life rules. If there's a grizzly bear, you don't go up and hug it. They want to eat you. So some fear is fine. Being worried about your finances is not a bad idea because we've got to pay the bills. 
But we cannot allow that fear to dominate, to erase all that we think about. It's a temptation that each and every one of us, individually and as an institution and as a society, can fall into. And so that's the call. That's the reminder. It's the time to bring us back to what we are to do. See, that's the beauty of this mission that Jesus brought us to. It doesn't matter where we sit, what's going on in the world. Everything could be falling apart, and our job still is to make disciples. Oh, Pastor Luke, what about this war, this bad thing, or what the politicians are doing? Your call is to make disciples. We are called to do one thing because there's one thing we can do. Love God, love others, and draw them into that beautiful, beautiful story. Be and make disciples. That is what we are about. Drawing people in to this wonderful thing that we have found. Because when you have found something as wonderful, as great as we have, you can't keep it to yourself. We have found that pearl of great price, the love that God has for us. Let us say a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your gift. Thank you for the call of discipleship. Thank you for calling us to follow that way. I pray that you give us the courage to continue to follow it ourselves in those areas that we are struggling in, that we are unsure about that we'd rather not follow some days. But not only that, Lord, I pray that you give us the courage to invite others to that way. I pray that you help us love those around us so we can invite them to this beautiful life that you've called us. Lord, I pray that you give us the courage to reach out, the courage to go and make those disciples. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing our hymn, Come Share the Lord, hymn 462. may be seated. Today we're having communion and all believers are invited to come and join us. We have confessed, we are forgiven, and so we can now join together and receive the Lord. This is probably my favorite part of being a pastor is the taking and partaking in communion because the beauty of it is no matter what, we can receive the Lord. It doesn't matter who you are, what you're feeling, where you're at in life, whether the 
pastor has preached well or poorly, whether the singers are doing good, we can join together and receive the Lord. If you uh, have your little cup and wafer, um, great. Does anybody need one? If you raise your hand, one of the usher will bring it to you. And yeah, you might as well start now. These things are hard to open. <laughs> Let's begin with a prayer of worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your glory, for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you that you came to this earth and died for us. We thank you that you raised from the dead, that you have defeated sin. And most of all, we thank you that you have welcomed us to the table to join you, to receive your body and blood. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 11, we've, we hear the words of institution where Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread when he had given things. He broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Let's pray the prayer of consecration. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of Thy tender mercies did give Your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by His one oblation of Himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world and did institute in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death until his coming again hear us O merciful father we most humbly ask you and grant that we receive these thy creations or these creatures of bread and wine according to thy son our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and then he had given thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink, all of ye, for this is my blood of my new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. If you can get out your elements. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank You that we were able to participate in this meal. Thank You for being here. Thank You that we were able to receive You. Lord, Thank you for making us one with you. In Jesus' name, amen.
as we finish celebrating communion, let's recite what we believe by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come together to bring these needs to you. Lord, you see the variety of needs that we have brought forward from Bill with his health struggles, for our comfort for the family and friends of Tom, for Melissa who needs to recover from COVID. Lord, for the need for a blessing on my ministry and the direction for First Congregational Church, Lord. We pray for your intercessions in these situations. Lord, we pray for healing and recovery of those, all those who are struggling with COVID. And Lord, we also pray for wisdom for our leaders, for President Biden, for Governor Whitmer, for Mayor Jim, Lord. We pray for all who lead and guide us from every level, that you guide them, you give them wisdom, that your glory might be declared. Lord, I pray that you, your Holy Spirit, flows and works throughout the world, that good may reign. We pray for peace and justice. And we all pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand as we sing the doxology. You see these small gifts that we've brought forward. Lord, we pray that these are used to declare your glory. We know you have no need of what we bring, but we bring it anyways because of our love for you and our desire to see your glory spread for, throughout the world. We pray that you use this to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our closing hymn will be Send the Light, number 437.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And so with you. God bless you. Go and make disciples.